I have Okay, everybody, we got about a minute before we start. Please um, at least put your cell phones on vibrate, if not, turn them off totally. Got a nice crowd here tonight looking for some good comments. We're changing up our public comment session a little bit tonight. Um, how about that? All right. More better? Okay. Good enough. We are um, changing up our public comment. Now it got more worse. Okay, now more better. All right. We're changing up our public comment session tonight just a little bit. Um, I'm making an allowance for um, uh, Renee Cahoon, who's the chairman of North Carolina Coastal Resource Commission, and some of her cohorts. Uh, somebody I saw come in the room started shaking. I think he was having withdrawals. Braxton Davis, who is uh, our former director. And uh, so it's good to see you all here. Uh, we're taking up an issue tomorrow dealing with the delineation of inland and coastal waters. This has a wide-reaching effect, uh, primarily with um, coastal regulations, and I wanted to afford uh, the um, CRC the opportunity to come and have an extended time to address us about their concerns about these lines of delineation. So, Ms. Cahoon, Braxton, whoever else you got with you, come on up, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, I believe it's on. I appreciate the time this evening that you have afforded me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much again for the time this evening. This is an issue that is very of grave importance to the Coastal Resources Commission, and we feel the need to make these comments, so I appreciate your time. By statute, both the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission and the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission exercise concurrent jurisdiction over joint fishing waters of the state. As part of their joint administration of these resources, the Marine Fisheries Commission and the WRC have adopted joint rules which delineate the boundary between the estuarine waters and the inland fishing waters. The boundary of the coastal inland waters established by these rules has significance far beyond jurisdiction for fisheries regulation. Several state laws for which the Coastal Resources Commission is responsible, including the Coastal Area Management Act and the State Dredge and Fill Act, refer to the boundary between coastal and inland waters as the extent of the state's estuarine resources. As a result, if the Marine Fisheries Commission and the WRC change the boundary of coastal inland waters or repeal the rule establishing that boundary, then estuarine shoreline and waters critical to the state's estuarine fisheries could be removed from protection under coastal management, water quality, and habitat protection programs. At the very least, changing this boundary could cause significant uncertainty about where the Coastal Resources Commission's more protective estuarine shoreline rules could be enforced. Buffers that are currently at 75 feet could go down to 30 feet, with that diminishment of those buffers, water quality can only be degraded, not improved as the state seems to want to have to do. Because our jurisdiction is set by statute, my commission cannot fix any problems caused by changes to the joint rules through rulemaking. It would only be through state legislature. For these reasons, the Coastal Resources Commission has been following the readoption of joint rules by the Marine Fisheries Commission and the Wildlife Resources Commission establishing the boundary between estuarine waters and inland fishing waters very closely over the past several years. I came before this commission a few years ago about this very subject, and we're back again. I am providing 2019 and 2022 letters from the Department of Environmental Quality detailing concerns over these proposed rule changes to provide more information. More recently, on March 18, 2022, I submitted comments to the Rules Review Commission after learning that the Wildlife Resources Commission had proposed amended and adopted rules published in the North Carolina Register on January 18th that will unilaterally change the jurisdictional boundary between coastal and inland waterways. I also alerted Governor Cooper to the Coastal Resources Commission ongoing concerns regarding these proposed changes to the Wildlife Resources Commission and MFC's joint rules establishing that boundary. In my comments objecting to the proposed rule change, I noted that for the last several years, 
the Coastal Resources Commission has reached out to the Wildlife Resources Commission and its staff and asked for a meeting to express its concerns over changes to this boundary. Given the significant implications of changing the rule relating to the boundary between coastal and inland waters, the Coastal Resources Commission is troubled by the Wildlife Resources Commission failure to articulate any justification for the proposed rule change. State law makes clear that the decision on coastal inland waters jurisdiction with respect to the Coastal Area Management Act and the State Dredge and Fill Act must be by agreement between Marine Resources, excuse me, Marine Fisheries Commission and the Wildlife Resources Commission. Unfortunately, it appears that the Wildlife Resources Commission has chosen to move ahead with its proposed rule changes in the face of significant objections from the Coastal Resources Commission and others. The North Carolina General Assembly created the Marine Fisheries Commission, the Environmental Management Commission, and the Coastal Resources Commission to work together to protect and restore fish habitats. One way we do this is through the CHIP program, the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. That plan recognizes that while the Marine Fisheries Commission can protect fish habitat from fishing-related activities, it cannot regulate land-based activities to improve water quality or protect fish habitat. The EMC and the Coastal Resources Commission have responsibilities for regulating impervious surface limits, vegetated buffers, and shoreline stabilization. I understand that the EMC is also responsible for stormwater management and water quality standards. It would be very unfortunate if changes to the joint rules of the Marine Fisheries Commission and WRC resulted in unattended negative impacts to the CRC's jurisdiction, which allow it to protect estuarine shorelines and the state's estuarine resources. The Coastal Resources Commission supports efforts by both the Wildlife Resources Commission and Marine Fisheries Commission to work towards updating the joint rules in a manner that addresses the Coastal Resources Commission's concerns and that are designed to narrowly address any problems identified by both of those commissions. I wish to thank Chairman DeVizel and the members of the Commission for listening to my comments this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cahoon. Um, normally we don't allow for any sort of questions and answers, but does anybody have a, any sort of comments, questions for Ms. Cahoon at this point? Because we're going to take this up further tomorrow. Okay, great. Not, thank you very much. Thank for you, Ms. Cahoon. Appreciate attention. it very much. Braxton, good to see you. Y'all, you're welcome to stay if you want. <laughs> okay, now we're going to go into our conventional uh, public comment session. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rob Bizzle, Chairman of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission. We'd like to welcome you to our public comment session where you have a unique opportunity to on the record, give comments in regards to the MFC's management of the state's public trust, estuary, and marine resource. I ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. You will be reminded when you have approximately 30 seconds left. Please state if you represent any group. If you address the commission tonight, you will not be allowed to do so tomorrow morning. Remember, this is a time to share a concern or gather information, not to be confrontational. Uh, we have um, 35 people who have signed up to speak, and there may be a few more coming. So if y'all can use any sort of economy to your comments while making your point, that would be greatly appreciated. So first up is Ron McCoy, followed by Bobby Brewer. I'm Ryan McCoy from Wilmington. First, I commend you for serving as a Marine Fisheries Commissioner. It's time-consuming, thankless work. You're criticized no matter what you do. You work in a system that was created from the 1997 Fisheries Reform Act. The system is designed to make decisions that divide our saltwater resource catch between user groups not manage the resource for stability and growth. Simply put, this 25-year-old law and the system it created has failed the resource. I speak in support of the resource. I speak in support of striped bass. Is your vote for striped bass this week resource management or dividing the catch? Choose resource management and keep the gill nets out of the New St. Pamlico Rivers. 
I close with this. To manage the resource, you must change this failed system. You should call a special meeting to work on changes. The change must have an MFC that represents the entire state, not just the coast. The change should stop dividing catch. The change should make timely decisions. The change should be insulated from user group politics. The change should learn from other Atlantic and Gulf states. They clearly have done a better job managing their saltwater resource. Don't forget, the resource cannot manage itself. That's your job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bobby Brewer, followed by Tim Faircloth. And could whoever has that phone check that, please? How are you doing today? My name is Bobby Brewer, and I own Bald Headed Bobby's Guide Service in the Oriental. How was that? All right. My name is Bobby Brewer, and I own Bald Headed Bobby's Guide Service in Oriental. And prior to the closure three years ago, I ran a lot of striper trips up in the Newburn area. And after, this, after the closure, we lost that, those trips, and we lost those revenues for that trips. Also, after the closure, I started educating myself on why the closure was necessary. I looked at things on the Marine Fishery website. I talked to marine biologists and also looked at independent studies. Prior to the closure, we were catching 16, 22, 23-inch fish, and occasionally we would catch a 25, 26-inch fish. About six weeks ago, I went fishing up there for fun, and the first fish we caught was 27 and a half inches. We hadn't catch those fish before. A few days later, a friend of mine caught a 30-inch fish. Again, we didn't catch those fish before. And that's significant because, as you guys are probably going to hear multiple times about the egg producing, you probably know this, those 22, 23-inch fish that we're catching are three-row class, and they're about a quarter of a million eggs on that. That 27, 30-inch fish that we caught, they got caught a few weeks ago, probably a million eggs. What we don't have yet is those 9- and 10-year-old fish, those 30-inch, the 35- to 40-inch fish that produce over 2 million eggs. And that's significant. We need those in the, we need those in the, in the fishery up there. So also what I did, I went to the Marine Fisheries website just to understand what the commission was responsible for. And this is what it said. And I quote, the commission is responsible for managing, protecting, preserving, and, and enhancing the marine and estuarine resources. Again, protecting, preserving, and enhancing. You guys are going to make a vote over the next couple of days on, on if that's going to occur or not. What I'd like for you to do is I would like for you to continue the closure of, of the noose and the Tarpan River systems for both recreational, for hire, as myself, and commercial fishing. Also, what I'd like for you to do is to continue the ban of netting up above the, up above the ferry lines in both river systems. Also, what I'd like for you to do is to protect, preserve, and enhance that fishery. 30 in, seconds. In conclusion, I'd like to thank you guys for your service. It's, a, it's a, a tough job that I wouldn't want. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tim Faircloth followed by Alan Faircloth. Um, two years ago, I came to the committee and I asked uh, a question uh, about uh, cast nets. Uh, if there was any study on any of our etuaries where the cast nets, even our commercial nets, whatever being done about uh, destroying some of our shrimp or fish in these etuaries. Uh, the committee was going to have somebody get with me and we were going to research this. Never have heard a word from the committee on this. What uh, we, my father and I, we're commercial fishermen. Um, we uh, pull nets in the waterway and everything else. And one of my questions to the committee at that time was, have you ever thrown a cast net on the dock up alongside the shoreline, get any slime in your net? Do you know what you're doing? 
Are you killing uh, fish? Are you killing shrimp for the next year's uh, catch? And nobody answered that question. And like I said, I have done some research on this. I've thrown my cast net. I'm just as guilty as everybody in this room. I've put it in a bucket. We've actually put it under a microscope. We're killing fish. Nobody's researched this. But you guys want to keep putting the commercial fisherman down that's dragging his net in the waterway or something. Have you even thought about everybody that is in a boat that has a cast net? They're going up in these estuaries, running 60 mile an hour. What are you destroying? The committee never got back with me two years ago when they were going to send somebody to research this. Has anybody on this committee researched any of this? Our boat population, our boat traffic is in, insane in the waterway right now. When I start, first started running a charter boat, in the year 2001, there were nine inshore charter boats from Sneeds Ferry all the way up to Emerald. How many you got now? This is a question I've been asking for a long time. Has this ever been researched? Are we all guilty? I think we are. But are we damaging our population and we don't know it? That's all I have for the committee. Thanks, sir. Alan Fairclaw followed by Jimmy Goodwin. I think that's Goodwin. Yeah. My name is Alan Fairclaw, and I'm from Hampstead, and I have a standard commercial fishing license, and I primarily uh, shrimp and flounder net. Um, the shrimping, uh, my concern this year, uh, I was first told that many of us called Wilmington trying to find out when they were going to open the water. About, we started that in August. And finally, we, I was told it was going to open the 11th of uh, September. Uh, we uh, started calling Moorhead, and thanks to the staff at Moorhead, we got the shrimping for the preferred water, uh, North Topsail Beach, et cetera, uh, opened on the uh, 1st of September. Had you not opened it until the 11th, it would have been another repeat of 2021, because then you opened it on the 9th, the shrimp were already gone. We got hardly anything. Uh, about enough said on flounder or on shrimp. I want to move to flounder. I know people envision that you're destroying everything with nets. That is absolutely false. I've got, um, I put out five nets and they're about 275 foot a piece. And that's about all I can handle and pick them up the next morning. But um, as we moved through the flounder season, I had like four days. And then I had to take off a day. I had a doctor's appointment. And while I was at the doctor's appointment, I was called <coughs> and told that I wouldn't be able to put nets back out because we had met the quota. Uh, I get back uh, home and start listening to things or asking questions. I'm told the quota... Uh, there was quota left, so they were going to switch that to uh, uh, hook and line and gigging. And I am not a fan of gigging. And most of you that know me know that. I can't look in the water two foot down and 30 decide seconds. how big something is, <laughs> okay? So um, anyway, uh, we... Uh, we just kind of uh, hung hung our head on the uh, on the net business, and uh, but again the gigging you were allowing 50 fish to be caught. I've I've netted for the last 10 years, and I've never put over 22 Time. fish. On Time, my boat. sir. Okay. And 
one last word. Though, well, your, your time's, your time's okay. up. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay. You know, fuel uh, fish in the net, so I'll put it that way. Okay. You do it again. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Jimmy, it looks like Goodwin or maybe Gaskins Jr. Goodwin. Followed, Goodwin okay. Yes, followed by Donald Willis. Well, sir, uh, I actually got a few problems here. One is the 73% reduction. Obviously, that was intended at just running. Sure. Uh, obviously, uh, the 73% reduction just was intended for it to run the commercial fishermen out of business. Got four days, as the man just said, for, um, for gill netting this year. Of course, sound, they got five days for pound netting, considering it takes – $5,000 to get your pound net set and give them five days, I think you're treating the boys unfair. The other thing is there is 780,000 uh, recreational license. There's 5,000 standard commercial fishing license, but there's 10.4 million people in North Carolina. Now, there is a few people, 4,000 CCA members, that has the money to come down every weekend throw hooking lines out, catch the fish. Most people in North Carolina, the other 9.6 million doesn't. Where are they going to get their fish from if you continue to decimate the commercial fishermen? And that is what's happening, whether it's by intention or not. You are, are decimating commercial fishing. You are not allowing the people chance to survive. If you wanted to cut it 25%, and open some hatcheries with the $22 million in license fees you all get every year? Why not have a hatchery in every river in North Carolina? Let's enhance the fishery. That's one of y'all's goal, enhance the fisheries. Why not by opening hatcheries in each one? And whatever fish is low that year, that's the one that you grow in that hatchery to help give the diet up and down flow, which is continuously in fishing. The predator, as the predator rises, the prey drops. As the prey rises, the predator will rise. Same thing. That is just the way fishing works and has since the beginning of time. You can't manage Mother Nature, which is more what you all are trying to do than anything else. You, to manage fisheries, you help to enhance it. If you want to manage Mother Nature, good luck. Ain't nobody been able to do it yet. And that's what's happening here. Y'all, with the speckled trout and all, three years is the max that you should ever have on any rebuilding plan. 30 seconds. Because you're going to have a freeze come in and decimate it, which is if there was ever a problem in the flounder industry, it was from the freeze. I was rode down the banks and saying the fish continuously upside down from the freeze, not from being caught by commercial nets, but from Mother Nature, which you all cannot manage. Y'all need to think about this. 9.6 million people in North Carolina relies on commercial fishermen to get their Time. fish. Thanks, sir. Donald Willis followed by Tim Hergenrader. And do make sure the microphone is pulled up to, to you so everybody in the back can hear, please. Hello, I'm Donald Willis. I'm here representing my company, Custom Marine Fabrication. Been in the fish and tackle industry for well over 30 years. I've been coming to fisheries meetings for about that long. I'm here to talk about Amendment 2. For three years, we've had this closed. It's cost me money, and I don't mind losing that money. Trust me, I don't. But to open this back up to nets before we even know what we have done, to check anybody with any scientific interest would want to know, do we have Noose River fish growing back in our rivers? Can we bring it back to a spawning river? But to just take it and destroy it before we even know what the heck we're doing is an absolute travesty. What have I sacrificed for? Why have I done this? Why have all the anglers done this in our communities in the Pam Tarn and Noose River to just slap us in the face and go, no, we're just going to destroy it and just let it go? How can we do this? And I'll tell you, up above the ferry lines is a whole different fishery than it is on the other side of it. 
It's a whole different thing. I've heard the whole time I've been doing this that the nets only catch what they're putting it on, that they're not destroying, the, that they're not hurting the resource. Up these rivers tell you a big time different story. I can tell you that. I can promise you that. Go look at it yourself. I've got people from Oriental driving to Newburn to catch fish because there's nothing down there. Got a friend of mine building a house in Lower Broad, and he's staying in Newburn right now because he can't catch fish down there. I mean, it is a whole different story, people. What we've been told is not true. I can tell you because I've seen it. I'm proud of what we've done closing this. I'm proud of the sacrifices I've made and all my anglers made. But we need to see what we've done before we open it back up to wreck our commercial fishing. We need to keep it closed, study it, and see what's going on. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Tim Hergen Rader, followed by Willie Phillips. Good evening. I'm Tim Hergen Rader. I live in Pamlico County. I'm a recreational fisherman and conservationist. I want to address the proposed reopening of the three rivers, Noose, Tar, and Pam, and Eddy. First, it was the shad the commercial fishing industry wanted to be allowed to target. No matter, the fish are overfished with overfishing continuing. Fortunately, that effort was stymied. Now, as Yogi would say, it's deja vu all over again. This time, it's striped mullet, overfished with overfishing continuing. No matter, the industry wants their road to send to China, Japan, or wherever and put more money in their coffers. The rivers are serving as nurseries for mullet and other species. Mullet will leave the rivers and head for the ocean to spawn. The netters will have their opportunities to slaughter the, them for their eggs as the fish move to the coast. Killing fish on their spawning runs seems to me to be the height of irresponsibility. Is it any wonder the fish are overfished? Not to me. One must ask why the river closures to netting are so egregious so as to warrant one attempt after another to reopen the rivers especially when the alleged targeted fish are, over, are already overfished with overfishing continuing. I don't think it's about the fish. I think the closures prove that with the nets gone, the fish populations increase. That the commercial fishing industry cannot abide. Power, not the fish. And make no mistake, the fish populations in the noose have increased since the closure was instituted. Anecdotal information for sure, but it beats the hell out of any data anyone else has since there's been no studies. In the noose, the mullet are omnipresent, as are virtually every predator that feasts on the mullet in Men 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 Hayden, a beggar's banquet out there. You reopen the rivers to noting and carnage will commence. The DMF is looking at a 30% reduction in mullet harvest, and you are considering increasing the harvest? Left hand not knowing or caring what the right hand is doing. Leave the net moratorium in place, move the closures to the tie-down lines, and you will solve the 30% reduction for mullet and provide more protection for stripers. The fish the closure was intended to protect. Open it, and the stripers will cut, be gone as a viable species, floating belly up in the rivers or hidden in the weeds. Bycatch. Thank you, and um, thank you for your time on the commission. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Willie Phillips, followed by Wayne Dunbar. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm here today presenting a resolution from Tyrrell County. Kathy had some copies, if none of you have seen them. But it's uh, opposing the jurisdictional expansion by uh, North Carolina Wildlife to eliminate the joint waters, which would effectively eliminate commercial fishing in numerous rivers in the Albemarle Sound and further south. It, uh, it's not just our county that's opposing this, but they're, all the surrounding counties are in agreement with it. You know, I've, I buy in my business from 100 fishermen a year, and I've been in commercial fishing for 50 years. I've worked with numerous members of the staff who are mostly gone now, I see, and, and some people that are on the commission. 
And it's taken 25 years of uh, PTSD therapy for me to come back before the commission after having served for four years in your place. So I understand the struggles that you deal with in trying to figure out how to allocate, and I think that's the issue. We can't raise enough fish for everyone. That's what's happening. So we're divided and we're just fighting over the crumbs. The pollution that comes down has turned our sounds and our rivers into nursery areas that can't function. So no matter what we do in this assembled group, we can't fix it until we fix the habitat and water quality situations. The Roanoke River has 82 discharges before it ever hits the sound. All it takes out is the poop. It doesn't take out any of the estrogen that causes sex changes or any of the forever chemicals. So we can't raise fish. We can't have enough fish for everyone. But you have a person now on the commission, Dr. Rader, who can help guide this commission in addressing this fact. And I hope you would put that, that pack on his back and ride him till he drops. Mm -hmm. Because it's something that has to be addressed if we're going to be able to have all of the people in North Carolina enjoy the bounty. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank sir. Wayne Dunbar, followed by Steve Etheridge. Uh, a few of you guys have got one of these. Uh, I run out of ink with my printer, so, so a few of you got one. The net ban above the ferry line is unjust to the 10 million residents of North Carolina by allowing a small group of anglers to fish and keep fish for their own personal use. What the pre previous North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission has done is to give the wreck anglers their own private fishing hole which consists of approximately 75,000 acres or approximately 132 square miles, while leaving the other 10 million citizens of North Carolina without access to buy fish provided by commercial fishermen caught from these waters, like restaurants, fish markets, farmer markets, fish houses, and grocery stores. The scientific data shows that small mass gill nets is not hurting the striped bass population. The hook and line fishermen continue to catch stripers in these areas while research data shows that wreck dead discards are around 40 to 48 percent on striped bass, and believe me, not everybody is throwing them back. As a commercial fisherman of 46 years, we traditionally fished in the springtime for menhaden for bait, with the rising price of crab bait going from $10 to $30 a flat in the last couple of years. This is very important to the crab industry to be able to fish up these rivers for menhaden. Also in the spring, summer, and fall, we fish in these areas for spots, which is always in high demand for the consumers of North Carolina. People love spots. Mullets. Over the last 20 years, we have seen an average of 1.7 million pounds a year harvest with an average of 700 commercial participating in an average of 8,000 trip tickets per year. According to these numbers put out by Division of Marine Fisheries, that is an average of 212 pounds of mullets per trip ticket. I cannot see where the mullets are being overfished, and so far this year it looks and sounds like this might be a record year on mullets. I think the mullets are doing fine. Speckled trout. Speckled trout. The last 20 years, the commercial landings have an average of about 280,000 pounds annually. Bauer, which is a biologist for the Marine Division, reported erect harvest has averaged seven times the amount of commercial harvest over a 2 million pounds. And erect discards on speckled trout has doubled the number of fish kept. So discards are about 4 million at 25% death rate, which is 1 million pounds of dead discards. I own Paradise Shores Seafood and Paradise Shores Guide Service. I study fish and wildlife management, but most important, I have studied and lived my life over the last 46 years on the water of eastern North Carolina Time. as a commercial Thank fisherman you, and guide. Thank the you, closure sir. of the Thank river you, to sir. commercial fishermen is totally Thank wrong. Thank you, sir. And to say mullet fishing is overfished is totally Thank you, wrong. sir. Steve Etheridge followed by uh, Tony Coth uh, like Cuthrell or Cothrell? Cuthrell. Uh, 
Thank you. Steve Etheridge, uh, full-time commercial fisherman. For, uh, I'm here to ask the commission not to adopt Amendment A to the strike mullet fisheries management plan. Two main reasons. The mullet fishermen do not agree with the data. Just four years ago, in 2018, biologists told the MFC and all committees no management action should be taken since the stock assessment update indicated that overfishing was not occurring. Also, it was noted that the next stock assessment should consider that striped mullet might be a forage species. And with that, it raised the SSB from 25 to 35 because it's a forage species. Now, that's kind of... This is the point that where main data suits used in the assessment are inaccurate is very troubling. The main data set comes from fisheries independent gillnet study. This consists of crews of marine fisheries people setting gillnets in random grids. The idea of unprofessional fishermen catching determining the lives of, and livelihood of hardworking professional fishermen is very disturbing and unacceptable. Their data does not match our mullet landings because so many important variables are not considered by biologists which are important. Examples being fishing for mullets one year it was blocked because of COVID. The next year they had a hurricane and lost all their freezers in Florida. And, and, and one year shrimping was better and one year crabbing was better. We don't fish when it's we, for fish for money. In summary, we asked the MFC not to adopt Amendment A because the data is incorrect and DMF is just now in October asking to form a committee of mullet fishermen and concerned parties for peer review. We asked the MFC consider allowing the peer review committee to meet with biologists for two years to help straighten out the data. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Tony, is it Cuthrow? Cuthrow, Q okay, excuse me, sir. Uh, followed by Rocky Carter. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity to come speak to you. Commissioners, the new ones, welcome. You got a tough job ahead of you. I've been living in Newburn now for about the past 15 years. I fished the Choan, the Roanoke, the Cache, the Tar, the Pamlico, the Noose, and the Trent Rivers. When I lived in Gates County in the 80s, we used to be able to dip my herring or herring fish fill up a 14-foot boat. You can't even find them anymore. The netters, they're gone. You can't even get stripers very much out of the Roanoke because all the dams that are going up there, they can't get past them to breed. Roanoke used to be the number one striper uh, fishery on the East Coast. We're starting now to get some fish back up into the Noose and the Trent in the Newburn area. We let these nets come back in where they want to go, and everybody has a right to earn a living. But you're going to take away the breeding stock. You're going to take away the babies. They're going to, the bycatch is going to be unbelievable. And within three years, we won't have a fishery that nobody can live on. We can catch one gray trout, four speckled trout, one flounder, one drum. With that kind of a catch, what are they coming up the rivers for with nets? I mean, you got to be kidding me. All I'm asking you is give these fish a chance to come up, spawn, grow, live to where we can all have a good time, make a living. Uh, not, just, not just a commercial fisherman, but all of us. If they keep bringing their nets up these rivers, it's going to be the end for everybody. Then what are they going to do? And who are they going to blame? We all need help. We all need fish. We all need places to catch them. Commissioners, that's your job. It ain't easy, and it's a handful. But you got to think about everybody, and you got to give the fish a chance to live. That's all I'm asking for. Give it a chance to live and give us all a chance to catch fish and eat them because it's good. It's good eating. Thank you very much. Y'all have a blessed day. Thank you, sir. Rocky Carter, followed by Dan Moses. Thank you. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak with you tonight. I would like to speak to you briefly about striped mullet, flounder, and striped bass. Striped bullet. 
is listed as depleted. Furthermore, stock assessments result predict continued decline in the populations due to their limited spawning biomass. Striped mullet have a 15-year lifespan. According to the data collected, most of these fish are less than three years old. Flounder, listed as depleted. The estimated number of spawning females is well below levels for a sustainable fishery. 20 years of neglecting scientific data from marine biologists has taken a toll on North Carolina's most sought after fish. In 1997, the Fishery Reform Act was passed into law. It clearly states the MFC shall adopt rules to be followed in the management, preservation, and enhancement of the marine and estuarine resources. This includes conservation and management measures that prevent overfishing. In 1997, when the law was passed, the krill limit was 10 flounder a day, 300 65 days a year. 25 years after that law was passed, now we have four weeks to target flounder with a recreational limit of one. Striped bass. DMF has insufficient data for a current stock assessment. So let's look at the last available data and its conclusion. It says striped bass populations in the tar noose and Cape Fear rivers are depressed to an extent that sustainability is unlikely at any level of fishing mortality. To me, that sounds like depleted. Striped bass have many obstacles to overcome if they are to become sustainable. Currently, over 90% of our, our hatchery raised, less than 10% are born in the wild. Conditions have to be almost perfect for a successful wild hatch. We have to protect the existing population to allow the big females who can lay one to two million eggs to repopulate our sounds, our bays, and our estuaries. 30 this, seconds. This summer and spa, fall, I spent considerable time on the Noose River. I saw drum, stripers, tarpon, and trout, all feeding on schools of mullet and menhaden. It is amazing what three years of recovery can mean to an expansive river like the Noose. Striped mullet, flounder, and striped bass live above the ferry lines to ensure their recovery, to ensure Time. the longevity of these species. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you sir. Appreciate you. Uh, Dan Moses followed by Ashley King. Good evening. My name is Dan Moses. I'm president of the Eastern Carolina Saltwater Fishing Club of New Bern. The club has been in existence since the late 1990s with a peak membership of approximately 90 people during the 20 teens. Our club has members ranging in age from the 30s to the 80s. We have an accumulative experience of many years fishing in the local rivers and creeks. I have lived in the area since retiring in 2005 and been an avid fisherman since that time. These comments come from my personal observations and from those of my club members. My comments are related to the fisheries resources that the Marine Fisheries Commission is charged with managing for all the people of the state of North Carolina. In order to aid in the recovery of the striped bass, the fishery that had become unsustainable, the Commission enacted Amendment to the Fisheries Management Plan. One of the provisions of that amendment was a ban on gill nets above the ferry line in the Neuse River, an area I'm very familiar with. Prior to the gill net ban, the fishing stocks of other game fish, such as speckled trout, red drum, flounder, and tarpon, were also declining in the Neuse River. There was apparent, this was apparent from fishing experiences by myself and other club members who had fished these waters extensively for many years. As recently as five years ago, it become, had become increasingly difficult to catch a legal-sized fish of these species. Over the last three years since the gill net ban was inactive, we have seen improvements in the numbers and sizes of these inshore game fish species in each year. These game fish all inhabit 
the same areas in the creeks and rivers and chase the same bait fish. You need to understand that you cannot manage one species without interacting and affecting all the other species. You have to manage the whole ecosystem. I spent a career managing and caring for our country's national, natural resources. One of the things I learned early in my career was that it does not always take a lot of analysis to come to an obvious conclusion. The gillnet ban is working as intended for striped bass. It also has had a positive effect on the other fishery resources in the upper Neuse River. For the benefit of the fisheries resource, it would make no logical sense to allow seconds. the gill nets to return. If you want to continue to manage a sustainable fishery resource, which you are entrusted to do for all the people of North Carolina, we should be here today looking at a more proactive approach to fisheries resource degradation rather than reactionary approach. A good place to start would be banning, banning gill nets in all eastern North Carolina River estuaries that serve as nursery areas for these fish species. Thank you for your time. Thanks, sir. Ashley King, followed by Ray Howell. Please, please, no comments in the auction. Audience, please. Thank you, Commission. Um, Ashley King, Keep Casting Charters. I have been on the Noose River for uh, nine years, guiding now. Been there since 2005. Uh, back in the day, a 26-inch striper was like seeing Sasquatch. I can take you back to the same spot where I caught my first big rock at. Um, <clears throat> since 2019, since the closure for these stripers, um, it, it's nothing to go on the trip and catch several fish, 8 to 10, that are 25 to 30 inches. The closure for the nets above the ferry terminal have really helped out the striper quality and numbers. Um, it's nothing to go down the river and see a school busting on bait and stuff like that. Um, I have myself lost trips because of they can't keep them, they don't want to target them. Luckily we've got, because of the nets, we've got a lot of drum in the river in Newburn. We've got a lot of trout this year. Um, and, and that is due to we hadn't had a cold stun in four, five, six years now. And the bait and the mullet are so thick up around Newburn. I, I've never seen bait like this. We've never, in my 15, 17 years on the New River, have never seen the tarpon run like it was this year. Um, the old drum bite around Newburn the last couple of years has been phenomenal. People are coming, staying at Oriental, and I'm getting them to meet me in Newburn for an old drum trip because of the bait that's there in Newburn. The whole point of this closure for the nets was to help the stripers and the heron reproduce, come back tenfold. So by letting the nets back up there, you're going to catch these stripers as bycatch. That was the whole point of the ban was for stripers. So letting the nets up there is not going to help the striper population. Um, <clears throat> I just urge y'all, please, to vote not for the, to keep the nets below the ferry terminal. I know, like I said, everybody said, trying to make a living. I get it. Totally understand it. The numbers downriver for the fish that they're targeting are increasing. So why are you going to let a net come up to target a fish? Well, not target a fish, but catch a fish that is 30 for seconds. the net ban. And also, um, I, I said that one of the last meetings we had, side imaging is a great tool. And these guys are strike netting in Newburn in our creeks at night. I can show you the evidence of the strike net marks on the bottom. And if anybody wants to get on my boat and see, I'll be more than happy to show you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, sir. Ray Howe followed by Bruce McLachlan. I'm Ray Helm. I retired and moved to Swansboro in 2008, primarily because of the fishing opportunities there. And since then, I have watched a decline in the fisheries um, that has been impactful in all these waters. One of the things that I do want to address is the um, 
my appreciation first to uh, the MFC members because you guys are between the rock and the hard place and have to do difficult things. What I'd like to speak about is the, especially the, the noose and the tar pam, as you look at the rebound of the fisheries in the areas above the netting. That is very good evidence that for years now, I've listened to the biologists talk about the difficulty in getting the, the biomass sufficient to have good, healthy spawns, especially in the noose, and what would need to be done to get that to happen. Well, the steps toward that have started with that net ban at the ferry lines. So I would encourage you all to be really firm about leaving those in place because using an excuse of an overfish and depleted species is absolutely incredible. The word rapacious comes to mind about that. But leave these fish alone, let the biomass expand, and then, and I did research up at National Institutes of Health, of Health before I moved down here, I know the importance of quality research. I know the importance of honest, true data. And institute good studies to validate what is happening in the noose and tar pam as a positive thing. Because Mark Twain made the observation that figures don't lie, but liars figure. 30 seconds. So in hearing lots of numbers being thrown around, good data is imperative to protect the species as a public trust. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Bruce McLachlan followed by Don Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gillnet ban above the ferry lines in uh, the CSMA is working. Uh, I won't repeat what you've already heard from several other people today, since you asked me not to at the beginning. Uh, but it's a, it's a tangible, noticeable difference to all of us who fish up there, uh, the improvement that has occurred over the last three years. That alone is reason enough to maintain the moratorium. But there's another reason that uh, we've touched on already. What is it that we would be fishing for with gill nets above the ferry lines? Uh, that moratorium is intended to protect striped bass, which uh, is so depleted that no harvest is allowed in the CSMA, nor should it be. Uh, there are endangered sturgeon in those waters, river herring. Uh, fishery has collapsed. Uh, they can't be fishing for them. Southern flounder is so severely depleted that we had a 30-day recreational season and, and the commercial uh, quota was reached in five days. I killed one flounder this year. It was a gulf flounder that I caught at AR-345. And Mr. Roller taught me how to distinguish the difference. American shad, severely depleted throughout the... Uh, Atlantic coast, and then uh, striped mullet, uh, which the DMF has uh, uh, categorized as overfished with overfishing occurring. If that data is not valid, then... Excuse me one minute. Please, sir, your comments are not welcome at this time. If you keep on going with them, I'll have you escorted from the meeting. Okay. Excuse then, me, uh, uh, thank you, sir. And then with speckled trout, the uh, 2022 stock assessment, assessment showed that uh, the fishery is experiencing overfishing, but it's not overfished. So it is a concern. So I think with all of those factors, there's no valid reason to return uh, gill nets above the ferry lines in these rivers. And in fact, I think we should consider extending those downriver to the tie-down lines. The uh, Rachel Rick's paper of uh, 2017 
uh, for the uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. And I, I realize that the, that uh, paper is disputed by some of our DMF scientists and others, but it cites the primary reason for uh, rivering striped bass mortality as gillnet interactions. Uh, yet many members of the commission and even DMF scientists themselves stubbornly resist those conclusions. The only way we can restore that fishery is to increase the spawning, spa uh, spawning stock biomass, and we do that by advancing the older females in the population. Putting gill nests back in the uh, waters is not going to do that, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Don Simpson, followed by Dennis Cox. Do want to remind everybody sitting in the audience that you have your chance to comment up here. Comments from the audience will not be tolerated. Next one I hear, I want to ask Marine Patrol to escort you from the room. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Don Simpson. I live in Fairfield Harbor section of New Bern. I wish to thank the commission for their work and management and to protect our marine resources. Without your regulations, I fear most of our marine wildlife would not only be a memory. I, along with most of my neighbors, are recreational fishermen. We enjoy fishing as often as we can, either by boat or along the banks of the news. We practice catch and release for the vast majority of our catch, and I, review, I view the regulations as a minimum standard to protect the resource. For example, I practice release over 20 inches for all speckled trout, because I believe that they are the breeders. I have noticed a marked improvement in the quality and quantity of fish available to catch in the, noose in the area of New Bern since 2019, when the gill nets were prohibited upstream from the ferry crossing. The commission has all the data necessary to document the fish population on the noose. I don't need to repeat any of that. Rather than, than repeat that, I wish to point out one positive impact the improved fishing has had on our community at large. I'm retired, therefore I am either fishing or walk, walking my dogs every day. I have the opportunity to meet new neighbors and discuss why they have chose to, chosen to relocate to our neighborhood. Most include the quality of the fishing and the boating on the noose as reasons for their choosing New Bern. I am requesting the commission to consider the current regulations prohibiting gill nets above the ferry line on the noose. In addition, I'm requesting the commission to consider moving the nets even farther downstream. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Dennis Cox, followed by Tyler DeWald. Hello, my name's Dennis Cox. I'm a commercial fisherman, seafood dealer, and I get it. I get the recreational side of the story. But one thing they don't really mention about is do you ever think about the farm, the spray, the chemicals, what they're doing to the water? Why about all these people moving here? What about them keep building houses on the water? They spray the yards. I mean, that's what's killing the fish. I wish they'd quit blaming commercial fishing on everything's out there. We out there, now we drop it. All we catch is a catfish. The catfish is our problem. Nobody wants to admit it. Down our way on the eastern end of the North Carolina, I mean, the Omar Sound, 1.9 million catfish gets caught. What do you think they eat? They eat everything. There's nothing in that water they don't eat. They even eat a, eat a Budweiser can if they can. Clams. I called them marine fisheries. I said, he said, the catfish are dying. They're dying from clams. They eat so many clams, they stop them up, and they can't breathe, and they die. I guess that's commercial fishermen's fault. You cannot keep blaming commercial fish for everything. If you want to catch a fish, catch a fish. But commercial fishermen puts fish on the table for everybody. You go and throw them back, we catch them and feed people. I don't want a tilapia. I don't want no, what's it, swag catfish from China. What, what's the point of, this is America. We should eat American food. And I like to say this. How can the commission let 
a former wildlife officer on his commission board and then let him propose that we close the lines on the boundary lines. Who does this? That's like letting a daggone atheist go to a Christian church convention. I mean, you cannot put no commission of wildlife crossover to a commercial, I mean, to a marine fisheries board. I think it was Pete Carnegie that come up with this idea, and we still fighting this. We've talked to the governor, the senators, and they all against this. Why do y'all continuously try to take our jobs? I get so frustrated. I call Miss Kathy. She says I'm mean. I'm sure I am mean. But I just want to fish. I respect your laws. 30 seconds. The stock assessment, rock stock assessment is crazily wrong. I call them. You cannot drag a net behind a little boat and catch what's there. Once you destroy the home or the habitat, you cannot drag that spot again for a year or two. You will never get sufficient data if you keep dragging the same spot. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Dennis Cox out. <laughs> Tyler DeWald followed by Vaughn Waterfield. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to take y'all north to the Albemarle Sound, show on Perquimans where the boundary lines are being moved. I've been in the commercial fishing business about 10 years. I'm 32. I started late, but it's my livelihood. And I'm going to be honest with y'all, if it wasn't for the invasive species of the Marcus Hall Blues, I probably wouldn't be doing this anymore. If we move those boundary lines, these blue catfish are going to demolish everything else that's in these rivers. They're, I'm not going to tell you. Dennis said the same thing. They eat clams. We've even seen them pooping grass from the bottom of the rivers. Um, the perch fishing up there has pretty much ended due to the small catfish that get entwined in the perch nets. I'm asking for y'all to vote against it just because it's going to pretty much demolish our end of the sound for commercial fishing, crabbing, I mean, Perquimans, Little River, Yopium, Scuppernong, Chowan, those are big crab grounds. And if we close those, that's gonna end that. Also, I wanna take in consideration Perquimans River. It's gotten the number one pound net for the state of North Carolina in it. That's history. That's a lot of history there. The first one ever in North Carolina. But, uh. I'm just going to ask for y'all to vote against it, just to save the fish from these animals that are coming to demolish it. I mean, before, five years ago, you never seen a catfish in Perquimans. Not a blue. you seen a channel or a bull. Not a blue. These, these catfish are adapting to salt water in Virginia. Um, we've all, we, I've heard them in Wanchies. I mean, that's a big range, and these fish don't care what they eat. But I'd like to thank y'all for y'all time. Thanks, sir. Vaughn Waterfield, followed by Earl Ward. Uh, good evening. Um, Vaughn Waterfield, um, commercial fisherman in Albemarle Sound. Um, just want to touch on the topic of the inland waters trying to be moved. Um, if you do this, it's going to hurt a lot of fishermen our way. Um, I fish gill nets and I crab. Um, this year, the water was so salty our way, all the jimmy crabs that pushed way up the rivers for the fresher water. Um, we were crabbing in way up rivers like, I mean, it, I've never seen it that go that far. Um, and like the gentleman before me said, these catfish, they are taking over. I mean, there's no doubt they are taking over. We've called them in the crab pots. They're eating the soft shell crabs. They're eating anything in their path. Um, so it's just it's it's just uh, if you do this, it's going to really hurt us, and um, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Earl Ward followed by Don Yeska. How are y'all? I'm gonna be kind of short because the three people in front of me are I'm from the same group, so we all agree on the same thing. But one thing I'm going to say is uh, I heard somebody said that herons, there's a shortage on them. If you don't think there's herons, then they just obviously don't want to see them because last year we're on the western part of the sound, 
And in Gatesville, the water raises real high. And last year, there was hundreds of thousands of herons all over the road down that boat ramp. I'm sure that's commercial fishermen's fault too, but they sure disappeared because a lot of feet tracks in the mud. So I still don't. And another thing, um, striped bass, the rock and the sounds. If there's not that many, I'd like to know why the quota's caught so quick. But at our more boats, there is a girl there during the rock season that's supposed to be checking people's, you know, catches when they come in. We come in, our feet's propped up on the dash, sleep, wind is up. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm sure she might be a girl scared to go talk to people, but whatever. I mean, that's, the data's not accurate for that also. So, I, and the pollution also, when we're trying to drop net, you ride up and down the sound, there's rock floating everywhere. We think that might do something with the spray in the rain, the runoff, but we're big catfishing now, and we're we're trying to catch as much as we can to help. Because I mean, they're eating what the wreck guys want. You know, they want the rock, the trout. The, that's a predator fish, and that's what we're for. So we're kind of against the whole lines being moved. So if y'all could take that consideration, we appreciate it. Thank y'all. Thanks, sir. Don Yeska, followed by William Troutman. First of all, thank you for allowing to speak tonight. I'm a recreational fisherman. Um, I think you've heard from everybody else what I was going to say, so I'm not going to repeat a lot of it and save some time for everybody else. But obviously, you know all the uh, overfish species are out there. You folks were elected or appointed to your possessions to save our fisheries. Not destroy it, but to save it. If we see signs that it's working by keeping these nets out of the area, then I suggest we lower them back further down the river and give our fisheries more space, let them produce. If we can get these numbers down, or up I should say, we have more fish in there, it's going to be beneficial for everybody. Not just a few, but for everybody. I know there was somebody who spoke earlier tonight that, um, and I think maybe he got confused, and I hope not, but he was talking throw nets compared to a gill net. A gill net goes from 100 yards to 200 yards. A throw net is maybe 10 foot, and you throw it by hand. I'm sure you all know that. So I do thank you for your time. I hope you keep the band in place. If not, move it down the river. Let our fisheries grow. We need it to grow for everybody. Thank you. Thanks, sir. William Troutman followed by Drake Hollander. Ah, thank you for the opportunity to come and say hello. First of all, I never knew I'd be sitting here talking to you. Uh, I moved here down at uh, 272 Yacht Club Drive back in 2002. I got the opportunity to retire from education had the opportunity to move down to a beautiful place, and we have enjoyed it since 2002. During the course of that enjoyment, we were able to enjoy the waterway, the intercoastal waterway, and be able to fish. I have three grandchildren, and we were able to take those three grandchildren and teach them how to fish. Teach a man how to fish, you teach him how to live, right? So we've had a great time there, and it has been wonderful to be experienced to be here. Uh, in 2002, when I first moved down here at Emerald Isle Bridge, from there a mile, you could find boats sitting out there. Uh, just And you could actually probably walk from one boat to the other. There were so many out there. Fish were being caught like nobody's business, particularly during the spot season, right? Uh, please don't go down there and look today because I don't think there's anything caught down there but a pinfish, okay? And where I live, I also... Listen at night at what the night sounds and what's going on and also have eyes to see. And so I go out to the intercoastal waterway and I hear these big diesel engines running and I know what's happening. But there's no fish, folks. The fish, fish are gone. You try it. My name is Trout Man. I love trout fishing. And I, you go try to find you one. She's tough. She's tough. 
thank you so much for what you do. I see everybody else that says thank you for it. The nets are, are just absolutely ruining the fishing industry, particularly from intercoastal from here to Moorhead City. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Drake Hollander followed by it's either Jimmy or Jerry Wilkins. Thank you guys for this time. Um, just like I want to start by saying I actually was almost on this path. I started with school with wildlife and fisheries biology. I moved to New Bern about six years ago. I'm a part-time fishing guide as well as a manufacturer's rep for the outdoor industry. I sell a lot of products from you know, crab lines to buoys to fishing rods, reels, terminal tackle, everything you can think of. The growth that we've seen, I think everyone has obviously seen the economic impact in the past three to five years, which is, you know, lined up with the closures and so on. Um, and not to beat the dead horse on kind of what everyone has said, but, you know, not only the economic impact that that has brought on and the amount of people that have gotten to get into fishing and teaching the kids fishing and, you know, the, the all these large companies that, I mean, I mean, how many tackle shops do you guys see when we drive around in East North Carolina? It's a huge part of the business and as that fishery has gotten better over these past few years all these businesses have been able to grow they're dumping money into all different sides of the economy and all the surrounding areas which has been a huge success um, so obviously we appreciate you guys for what you've already done and we hope that you continue to keep on this path you know if, if it weren't working then they wouldn't want to expand upriver up, you know in our instance it's up above the ferry line if it hadn't working if the fishing weren't actually better up there they wouldn't want to be up there and just to keep it simple, thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, is it Jerry or Jimmy Wilkins? Jerry. Okay. Followed by Paul. It's getting late in the evening. Doll or Dean or something. We'll get you, we'll get you whenever. All right. Thank you. Thank you all, all for letting us come and speak to you this evening. Uh, I wanted to say that I started fishing in the 1960s with my father. And I fished extensively in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s from the Shoan River all the way down to Wilmington. Uh, we fished for everything from stripers and heron, red drum, trout. We've, we've done a lot of fishing. Uh, I've seen the fishery decline starting mostly in the mid-80s through the 90s and into the 2000s. Uh, it's, it's been very sad for someone who liked to fish to be able to go fish and hardly catch a fish or one small fish. Finally, here in the last couple of years since you've had the, the net ban, uh, the fishing in, in the news, as all these other people have said, has improved drastically from what it had been for maybe 10 or 12 years or so. So there's an improvement for that. And so I'm here to say let's keep the nets out for a while and let's see if we can't get these fish populations back to what they were in the 60s and 70s when everyone was catching fish. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Paul... How do you pronounce your last name? I can't quite make it out. Yes, <laughs> not as bad as mine. Dale. Dale. Okay. Paul Dale followed by Ken Thomas. My name is Paul Dale. I live in Newburn. Uh, I'm a recreational fisherman, and I've everything has pretty much been said. I just like to say that let's not kick the can down the road. Let's let's keep. The progress that we've got going and try to increase it rather than back up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ken Thomas followed by Stuart Crichton. I guess we're at a point where we're all sounding like a broken record. <laughs> yeah, I grew up fishing down here in the 70s with my grandfather and I moved back here about 10 years ago. And I wanted to pass that along to my grandchildren. I can't catch a fish I can keep. I mean, I really can't. I go to the fish market on the way home, and I can pick up 12, 13-inch flounders and trouts, but I can't catch one and bring it home. I think the, the netting is a big issue. When my grandfather had his place in, in Atlantic Beach, you know what? We used to find starfish. We used to find seahorse. We used to find sea urchin. We don't see any of those anymore. That, that wildlife's gone. And our fishing is, for recreational guys like myself, is, is ending. Now, please do something about this net situation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Stuart Crichton followed by 
Bobby Rice. Good evening, everybody, and uh, like always, thank you very much for letting me speak. I really appreciate the job that you're doing. I know that it is often thankless and it is very difficult. You've heard that numerous times tonight, uh, but it, no, it's, it still rings true. Uh, this is a tough job. You are, you are charged with recovering, conserving, saving the marine fisheries that we all enjoy, and they are in trouble. So you have some unenviable decisions that you have to make tonight, or sorry during the meeting this week. Of course, my comments are gonna focus primarily on striped bass. I've got a uh, rather long dissertation there that I'll never speak through in three minutes, but I do want you to uh, pay attention to some of the data that I cite as I make these comments. Uh, the first thing I wanna say is that, folks, it is vital that you maintain the current gill net restrictions on the Noose and the Tar Pamlico River systems. You ask why? Well, first and foremost, because they are working. You've heard from numerous folks tonight that, you know, even though their, their reports are anecdotal, that the fisheries, striped bass first and foremost, are improving. The uh, number of observations there really can't be ignored. You have to pay attention to that because it's universal in what they're saying. The fisheries are improving. And it's not just the striped bass. It's other fisheries as well. Tarpon, red drum, trout. They're all benefiting from this closure. You need to pay attention to that. You need to follow it up with further and careful, detailed divisional study. Uh, you haven't heard this, but this is what the public wants. Documentation in amendment number two shows that when asked specifically about maintaining the closure on the CSMA, 60% of online responses wanted the restrictions to remain. Only 12% wanted gill nets put back in those areas. Public comment at the February MFC meeting was overwhelmingly in favor of maintaining the closure. It was relatively even at the other two sessions, and I would also like to directly ask what the online comments in front of this meeting look like. I'd like to hear what they, uh, what they represent. Um, returning gill nests to these areas will put undue pressure on numerous species that are either in decline, depleted, or collapsed. It is important to take stock of just how many important fisheries are in trouble. 30 seconds. Dang. Um, <laughs> all right, well, um, y'all please take note of that. Um, I did want to mention something about the ASMA. That's our last naturally reproducing striper stock that we have. And guys, whatever you select for your management measures, you've got to get that right. You cannot allow albemarle stripers to go away. We cannot return that into a put-and-take fishery. That's just unacceptable. Time. Thank you, sir. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Bobby Rice, followed by Bill Craven. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Bobby Rice, Carteret County. Uh, <laughs> A lot was said to you tonight, uh, and a lot I'm not going to repeat, but the closure has, is, is working. I think it's a testament to what, if, what little bit we can do and what a big deal it can make out of in, in our environment. Uh, I hope you consider keeping it closed. I would like you to consider some other areas in the state that need help as well. So you, you've done a great thing. And I think by putting the nets back in, you will destroy everything that you have built. And I think that's where we're at right now. Uh, I'm not going to beat that dead horse like everybody else. So thank you for your time, gentlemen and ladies. Thanks, sir. Uh, Bill Craven followed by Chris Chadwick. Thank you all. My name is Bill Craven. Last year, I moved to Minnesota Beach just upriver from the ferry. Right across the river 
is the Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point. I joined Facebook fishing groups to learn about fishing in the Noose River. I noticed there were frequent postings on Facebook by Cherry Point service men and women asking how and where to fish in Hancock, Slocum Creeks, and in the Noose River that border the three sides of the military base. The volume and details of the comments back to them was incredible. My son and daughter are both serving in the Army. This gives me an emotional connection to the men and women in the military serving our country and why I'm here today. This past weekend, there was a posting by Cherry Point on Facebook. It said, Marine Corps Community Services hosted a fishing tournament. The fishing tournament allowed U.S. Marines, their families, and air station civilians the opportunity to gather for fun and collective competition. I asked a neighbor across the street who works at the station, I said, is this common that they have a, a, a fishing tournament? And he said, he did not hear of that, but rumors on the base is that they're starting to catch fish around the base and the fish are big. So the powers that be wanted to capture the momentum of this enthusiasm. I asked the board to do what you can do to ensure Slocum Creek Hancock Creek, and the Noose River around the base and surrounding community where the service men and women and their families live have abundance of fish. And as a footnote, the military is the second largest contributor to the North Carolina economy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chris Chadwick, followed by Cameron Pappas. Being a county commissioner might be the Marine Fisheries Board. First off, you get in the microphone so we can get you on record, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening. My name is Chris Chadwick. I'm a Carrick County Commissioner. Uh, Carrick County Board of Commissioners passed a resolution opposing the continuation of a gillnet ban in the Upper Noose and Pamlico Rivers that we presented at your last meeting. We asked the Marine Fisheries Commission to take action this week to remove the ban based on the reasons presented in the resolution. The Carrick County Commissioners are also concerned about the potential actions of the Marine Fisheries Commission may be taken regarding conservation of striped mullet. Carrick County has been and continues to be one of the most important areas for the North Carolina mullet fishery. Beaufort was historically known as Fishtown due to its extensive mullet fishery. We urge the Marine Fisheries Commission to consider the economic and social impacts of the proposed 30% reduction in harvest, especially when based on a population assessment that appears not to match with what the fishermen are observing. I think this year they've had one of the largest years of melaton that I can remember. Our commission does not understand how scientific experts can say the data in the prior fisheries management plans show that overfishing was not occurring in 2005, 2015, and 2018 in the mullet fishery, but now say that overfishing has been occurring for almost 18 years. The population is in trouble and immediate action is required using only, using only more recent information. Fishermen this year have reported highest proportions of mature mullet males with the larger females that are primarily harvested as well as high catches. The prior scientific assessments and current observations are not indicative of a population that is in such dire straits that an immediate 30% reduction in harvest is necessary and raises serious questions about the accuracy of your own population assessments. We ask you to consider these uncertainties and contradictions when you make your decisions later this week. And I think all commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen can agree, a lot of the problem I'm seeing and hearing about in these rivers comes downstream from Raleigh, sewage being allowed to dump millions of gallons of sewer in rivers so many times a week, and the hurricanes we have washes all that down here. You ought to be there to Cedar Island Beach uh, after seconds. Hurricane Florence or uh, some of the more recent hurricanes, and there's everything from school desks to, uh, you know, sewage products, and it's just a just everything comes down our on us, and I think that's a big problem with 
a lot of your small fisheries up these rivers. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Cameron Pappas, followed by, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and Anthony Osborne. Good evening. So uh, the DEQ has numbers listed on commercial harvests in pounds. Uh, and just keep in mind when I'm going over some of these numbers, flounder season started in 2019. So 2021, there was 200,396 pounds. That's the highest since 2013. Speckled trout, 2019, 378,000. 2020, 568,000. 2021, 694,000. Highest recorded as far as I could see back to 1972. Average from 2000 to 2019 for speckled trout was 237,000, so over double in 2021. Now for striped mullet, you know, 2020 was 1,299,000 pounds. 2021 was 2,135,000 pounds, highest since 2002. So if the argument is to put gill nets back above the gill nets or back above the ferry lines to target striped mullet, well, you've, you've got 2,135,000 pounds in 2021. That's the highest since 2002. So. I urge you to look at these numbers, try to come to a conclusion. And my fear is that because the flounder season is active, which I'm not opposed to, again, but now all these other game fish are getting targeted. And then if speckled trout comes back as depleted, if red drum comes back as depleted, are we going to have seasons on those too? Because if that's the case, if we have seasons on all these game fish, if that's not a sign of a poorly managed fishery, I don't know what is. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anthony Osborne, followed by, and I'd be darned if I know who this is. It looks kind of like a Brent Turner, but who, whoever's number six on this <clears throat> slip comes on next. <clears throat> Good evening. Can you hear me okay? All right. Well, I ain't going to beat a dead horse or anything, uh, but my name's Ozzy. I'm a North Carolina native and full-time fishing guide up and down the coast. Um, pretty much uh, everything I was going to say has been touched on. You know, I think y'all are well aware that the devastation a gillnet can have if you're moving back up the ferry lines. I think you're well aware of the... Uh, state revenue that can be made in the rec recreational fishing industry. And i um, not going to hit on that. But what I do want to ask you is um, I think that the, the netters aren't the only ones dropping their boats every morning to make their living. Um, I feel like the, the guides are not getting much advocacy. Um, there's a lot of rules that kind of seem to uh, cater to the commercial guys and the netters, you know. And... Um, I just feel like the, the full-time guides or the part-time guides not getting much advocacy. Um, so I would definitely ask you to take that into consideration. Um, and that, that's pretty much everything I got that hadn't already been hit on. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to call it number six. Who, who is number six on here? I've had two greater minds than me trying to read his name, and we failed. All right, well, it looks like Brent, Brad, Turner, something like that. I'll come back. If you had not had a chance to speak, I'll give you an opportunity anyway. Bradley Styron, followed by Caton Daniels. Good evening. My name is Bradley Starr, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. I had several questions I wanted to ask, but uh, some of them have already been answered. But the one on the, that bothers me the most is the independent given it survey. That's the way that you're determining how these fish are overfished. It's 
they said for 20 years, and it's been, they said it's been going on for 20 years and it's still being overfished. Well, I've been around here as long as most people have, and I've seen it come and go. And that's just as far from the truth. And I'll give you an example of the independent gillnet survey. I ran up with a couple people one time this summer, and they were setting nets, and I stopped to them, and uh, I asked them what they were doing, you know, you know, if they were catching anything. And they said, we're not doing much. I said, and I, I noticed the gear they had, and I asked them, I said, well, why are you using such varied gear? They said, we're contracted by the North Carolina Division of Marine Fishers to do independent gillnet surveys. I said, so you're deciding who's going to get what. Where they were using the gear, the only thing I ever saw caught there was Manhattan. So, you know, I, if you're going to, if you're going to take a, an approach like you're taking to put people out of business, at least do it the right way. Get somebody who knows what they're doing. Why don't you go ahead and get some of these commercial fishermen? You've got some of the best fishermen in here there is in North Carolina. They can show you where it's at and how to do it. I mean, if you're going to do it, at least give us a fighting chance. This is, this is ludicrous what's going on here. I mean... You're talking about taking the better part of the season. In 2020, there was no season. There was no road to be brought because of the COVID deal. All right, 2021, most of the boys that are fishing now were shrimping. And this year, there's not been many shrimp, so they're mullet fishing. But if you talk about the trip tickets, if you go back to the trip tickets, then how are you going to get an accurate assessment by using trip tickets? Because, like I said, in 2020, there was no road season. In 2021, seconds. the boys went shrimping. Now they've had to revert back to it. So it's, I think you've got a tale of two different people here. You've got people that really want to stop the commercial end of it, and then you've got the people that depend on it. And you look at back here and these people behind me, they're families. They have children, and this is how they make their living. And I feel like if you're going to make draconian changes like this, at least do it with the best data. Don't go hard Time. somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. Thank you, Bradley. All right, thank you. Good to see you, by the way. Uh, Kate and Daniels, followed by Pam Morris. Good evening. My name's Kate and Daniels. I'm a fifth generation full-time commercial fisherman from Carter County. After reading the 182 page paper on the stock assessment on striped mullet, I found all that any of us in this room need to hear or focus on in the fifth paragraph on the bottom part of page 26 and I quote, subsequent management options were developed by the NCDMF and presented to the FinFish Southern and Northern Advisory Committees in July of 2018 to receive input prior to finalizing the NCDMF recommendation. Recommendations were then presented to the NCMFC at its August 2018 business meeting. The DMF and the advisory committees recommended that no management action be taken since the stock assessment update indicated overfishing was not occurring. The DMF would continue to monitor trends in the commercial fishery and fisheries independent indices. The recommendation was approved by the NCMFC further down. It also states that commercial landings were reduced in 2019 and 2020. What happened from 2017 and 2018 when all this was done and now? Was the 20 years of data that was studied before that, was that no good? I think we can call it what it is. It's no more than another nail in the coffin of the commercial fishermen in North Carolina. We can't stand but just so much we've been took from and took from and took from. I heard, I want to call him a gentleman, but I can't, talked about the sacrifice that he had had to make. They don't know nothing about sacrifice. If you want to talk about sacrifice, talk to some of these families and men that's been through what we've been through. I'm 27 years old trying to raise a family, and I've invested everything I have in this industry. What future do I have? I look, ar I look around and I look 10 years ahead, what future is there for me to stay in this industry? Do y'all want fresh local seafood to be able to be caught? 
if you do, you've got to. We can't. We can't be robbed from anymore. There's got to be something left for us to do. I mean, is sacrifice. We've we have sacrificed all we can sacrifice. There's obviously no trouble with the strike mallet. I've seen more strike mallet this fall than I've seen in my entire life. In 2020, like Bradley said, there wasn't a rose season. I usually shrimp. This year, there isn't many white shrimp, so I mallet fish. We go after the money, not the, not the fish. I'm asking you to please use common sense, and may God bless you to make the right decision. That's all. Thanks, sir. Pam Mars. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm Pam Morris. I'm with the Carter County Fishermen's Association. And <clears throat> really, I'm not here on behalf of them. I'm here on behalf of me. And I just want to say I've heard this a couple of times now. And two things, maybe three, really pop up to me about this. One is, yeah. So the last time we heard Stripe Mullet, everything was just grand. And now here we are mm, two years later, and now everything's not grand. So what's changed? Well, one thing, the formula they're using has changed, and it's like you're comparing apples to apples. Same thing happened with drums. Same thing happened with speckled trout. And I'm a little weary of this formula being used against the commercial fishermen and therefore all the consumers in this state of North Carolina because you're denying them, who are the biggest user group, access to seafood. And as far as this net thing goes, <laughs> this so-called net ban has not saved one fish. What you're doing is taking fish away, again, from the greater public for the benefit of a few people and I don't think that's right. I think that's something that is for everybody and vilifying this whole vilifying of gill nets is getting a little weary and they are very selective gear. If you knew anything about them at all, you'd know this and if they are executed properly, they are very good fishing gear to use. So, but all of this doesn't produce any more fish. You're going to have the amount of fish you're going to have. And what determines that mainly is not fishing effort at all. It is environmental issues. And I feel like the commercial fishermen all through the years, and I've been around, look at these gray hairs, I've been around this block a long time. And we are always getting the short end of the stick, always, without fail, always, because they can't do anything to anybody else except us. And that's not fair. So thank you very much. I hope you remember us tomorrow. Thank you, Pam. Whenever you vote on this stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Has everybody had a chance to address the commission tonight that cares to? Yes, sir. I, guess my name got left out the list. I don't know. Maybe you're to mystery number six. I don't know. What, what is your name? Bradley Smith. That's it. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We One got way or another, right? Cool. We got it figured. Oh, we got it. That's what it is. So, uh, let me keep notes. But um, we good? Ready to talk? Okay. All right. So, um, I got stationed here in 2002. Um, prior Marine, just re recently retired. Uh, I became a full time charter captain um, once I retired. Um, I did that just solely because I had a passion for pe putting people on fish and things like that. Um, so um, that's kind of what I've done since I've been here. Um, with that, I've seen other fisheries um, outside of North Carolina do greater things. I do know this meeting is solely for Amendment 2 for the striped fishery bass going north. Um, above the ferry lines. And we've seen tremendous output on the striped bass 
going that way forward, everything, you, you can do what you want to on that. We, we, we've seen uh, a great rebound on that. Um, uh, what, what I've also observed since being here is I got the privilege to write a paper on doing things what I saw from the outside perspective um, was the South Marine Atlantic Fisheries trying to come into North Carolina to do things, and North Carolina pushed them out because of the commercial fisheries and the fines that would, would be behind that, um, which I felt was wrong, but there was a lot of, you know, back and forth. Like, I get it. Like, there's a commercial, there's a recreational fight, no, ba no matter what way you want to look at it. Everybody's going to hate everybody I in this fight. Um, and there, there's never going to be a right or wrong behind this situation. Uh, I, I've sit here and listened to commercial folks plead, like, wash coming down, everything, you know. I get it. Like, it, it's wrong either which way. Um, you have recreational guys, you got commercial guys, both sides doing wrong, both sides doing right, but who's doing right from wrong? Um, there needs to be a fine line. That's where you guys kind of come into play, right? 30 seconds. That, that's, that's you guys' fight on that. Um, this is just my two cents, figuring it. Um, I got a whole research paper written out and I've sent to uh, both sides of marine uh, federal recreation uh, all the way up to Congress, Senate, everybody doing things when I had to do a final research paper. It, 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 is, it, it is what it is. Um, but something Time. needs to be done. Thank you, sir, for your comments. All right. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Now, has everybody had a chance to address the commission tonight that cares to? That being said, we will see you all tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock.